All right, Katie Peterson, some of you might have her in lab. She is teaching a J-term on museums matter, uh, which I think you get to go to like different museums and actually be a part of like their collection and like collecting process or curating process. There's some cool hands-on stuff with that one. And then aquatic stewardship is by Dr. Elias, uh, talking about fisheries, um, fish in Minnesota, watersheds, anything you can think of with aquatic stewardship. All right. Any questions about J-terms? When is J-term registration? November 1st. All right. Sounds good. Uh, so you have some time to look at all of them. I, I kind of glanced at them, and there's some really cool ones out there, which I am kind of jealous about. So on to the exams. All right, exam two, overall, we had a much higher average, all right, average of 84%. A large part of that was uh, due to those three extra Nobel points. Uh, so that really helped bolster scores. Um, I did end up throwing out two points, all right? So the first one was question 21. A lot of people got this question wrong. All right, so mutations that inhibit the function of photosystem one, uh, but not photosystem two, would result in a plant that could still generate. Anybody got an answer for me? D, yes, it is D. Yeah, so photosystem two, it's coming later on, right? That's a second step. All right, so we're still going to be able to produce oxygen because photosystem 2 is unaffected. Uh, still producing ATP because photosystem 2 generates that electron gradient on that, or electron transport chain that creates that gradient. All right, and then we're still going to have NADP plus floating around, not um, being made into NADPH because that happens in photosystem 1. All right, now I have a suspicion that maybe... This kind of threw a lot of people off having that in there because I guess it isn't produced. And if you're thinking about the wording, I have a suspicion that that was the case. All right. Um, so I gave you a point back for that one. The other one, which I was a little disappointed because we talked about this a lot. All right. So C4 and CAN plants, they're going to produce a four carbon molecule when they're initially fixing CO2. I wanted the name of that molecule. Who has that name for me? Oxalacetate. Yes, I said that word a lot of times. I stumbled over that word a lot of times. Oxalacetate is in C4. It's in CAM. It also shows up in uh, cellular respiration in the Krebs cycle. All right, so if you flipped your page to the other side, it's actually written out in that cycle as well. All right, so I was really hoping that would kind of be a, a cue to help you remember what that one is. All right, but really low uh, rate on who got it correct for that one. So I gave you back another point. All right, so you had the potential to get five extra points on this exam by either doing little to nothing or nothing at all. All right, so we had some really good results. Now, if you're concerned about your grade at all at this point, all right, so midterm grades are due. I have to submit them today, so I'm assuming you should be able to see them this week is what I'm guessing. Um, if you have any questions about your progress in the class, you need to know what the likelihood of uh, you passing, you want to point breakdown even more, come visit me in office hours. All right, I am more than happy to discuss that. All right, any other questions about the exam? All right, I am not immune to mistakes. I would encourage you just to go through and make sure I tallied your score correct. Um, and if you do notice a mistake, just let me know. I'm happy to fix it. All right, but if there's no other questions, we are going to move on to DNA structure and replication. All right, so the next segment that we're going to be talking about is really about DNA structure, how cells are going to divide, mitosis, meiosis, uh, transcription, translation. All right, but we're going to start with the basics today. So for those of you that take notes before class, I did make, a, I would say, quite a few changes to the lecture, but nothing about the content. And right, I just basically condensed a lot of slides together. So you might notice that the slides look a little different. All right, so if you took notes beforehand, no worries. Nothing uh, content-wise has changed. All right, so this first part should be a lot of review. All right, so what is genetic material? Now, we haven't quite gone over this yet. I'm sure you've talked about it in other classes. 
Um, but there's four criteria that we need for genetic material. All right, it must contain information. All right, it has to contain all the information necessary uh, to construct an entire organism. All right, so it has a lot of information in it. Must be able to be accurately replicated. All right, it must be copied. Uh, that way, when it's trans uh, during transmission, it can relay that copy to other cells uh, or from parent to offspring. All right, so we're we're moving that data along between cells, and then variation. All right, there's going to be variation. Uh, so there's going to be differences in your DNA that's going to account for variations within a species or between a species. All right, what's it, that's what uh, makes us human. All right, we have variation that makes us different from, say, a chimpanzee. All right, so that's the four criteria that we need for genetic information. All right, so in the late 1800s, uh, some scientists came together and they came up with the biological basis of heredity. All right, and they basically figured out that the chromosome is what carries the genetic information. Now, there's some cool experiments in, that your textbook talks about that we're not going to have time to go over. Uh, if you're interested in how they figured this out, go ahead and look at the experiment. It's, it's quite cool. All right, so they found out that we have this genetic information in chromosomes, and then ultimately that information is in the DNA within your chromosome. All right, so all living organisms use DNA. All right, uh, viruses are not considered a living organism. Uh, but they have their own genetic material. They use RNA. We're mostly going to be focusing on DNA for a bit um, during this first part of this unit. All right, so a lot of this will be review. So let's go over the nucleic acid structure. All right, so nucleic acids, those are polymers of nucleotides. All right, so DNA is just one large macromolecule. And it has these levels of structure. All right, so the first level is just the nucleotide, right? The basic building blocks of DNA, also RNA. Those will be covalently bound together to create a strand. All right, so a linear polymer strand of DNA or RNA. Uh, next step would be the double helix, which we touched on a little bit here. All right, so the double helix. We have these linkages between the two strands, these hydrogen bonds that link them together. All right, so we get that double helix. The next step would be the actual chromosome itself. All right, so this is where we get DNA associated with different proteins uh, that are going to be transform this DNA into a more complex structure. All right, and we'll highlight this a little bit more at the end of class today if we have enough time. And then finally, the genome. So if we're talking about the genome, we're talking about the complete complement of genetic material in an organism. All right, so the genome, that's everything. That's all the information. All right, so quick review. So DNA versus RNA, mostly focusing on RNA. All right, but they're all composed of nucleotides that have these three components. All right, we have our phosphate group. We have a pentose sugar which in DNA is deoxyribose, RNA is ribose. And then we have our nitrogenous base, which is either a purine or a pyrimidine. And then the difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA has uracil instead of thymine. All right, so you should know this. This should be review. We also are going to link these together in a strand. All right, so remember our phosphodiester linkages. We're linking the phosphate group uh, and two sugars together. We're forming this backbone, all right, with phosphates and sugars. Those bases are going to be towards the middle, all right. The, the bases are what's going to be hydrogen bonded to each other to form that double helix. And then it has directionality, which we haven't really talked about yet. All right, so if we look at a strand of DNA, a single strand, there's going to be a directionality that's normally going to be written in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. All right, so where do we get those numbers? So if we look at the carbons in our backbone here, we can see that they are numbered. So carbon one is starting here, two, three, four, and five. All right, five and three, that's where those phosphates are linked to the, um, to the, to the sugar. 
All right? And that's what's going to have help us uh, talk about directionality. So 5 to 3 would be 5, 2, 3. All right? So that's generally how we write things out. Uh, so for example, in this one we have 5 prime to 3 prime, T, A, G, C. All right. So there's a lot of features of DNA. I'm not going to spend time on this because we've already talked about this. All right? You should know this. But I think there's a good video that kind of helps uh, you remember what's going on. And it's also going to talk about how DNA is a right-handed helix, which is something we have not talked about yet. So let me make sure. I'm hoping that's the right output. Let's see what we got. I feel like this is a there really we go. bad dance maybe. Yeah. When you say right-handed, left-handed, what do you mean? Like if I did a PhD in like genetics, I'd be Dr. Jean, because that's my second. <laughs> when you see in a movie where they represent DNA correctly, and then be Dr. Jean, Jean, right? So if you're looking at it from the side, what makes it a right-handed curve? So... <laughs> DNA is a molecule in each of our cells and it essentially acts as kind of like an instruction manual. What kind of words do you have? Well, yeah, what okay. does that mean? That's a dominant allele. So if one of your parents has blue eyes and one of your brown. I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Then you're more likely to have brown. Double helix. Oh yeah, that's another yeah. one. That's another key word. Sugar um, phosphate backbone. Oh yeah. Just trying oh, to bring yeah. out those things. It's um, we've got we've got the four groups, A, T, C, G. So the four different bases, as they're called, are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and there is a pairing rule. So guanine and cytosine always pair together, and thymine and adenine always pair together. I was always taught that the way to remember that is that the C and the G are both curved, and that's how you remember that those two always go together. So they pair together to form the rungs of the ladder, and actually the ladder has got a bit of a twist to it, which gives it that sort of double helix structure that you often see in sort of television and things like that. Now this is a model of a molecule of DNA. DNA molecules are made of a large number of atoms and are quite complicated. It's a double helix, but it has to go the right way. I, I don't know which way. Uh -huh. All right. DNA and RNA are both chiral molecules, which means that they have a particular handedness because chiral actually comes from the Greek for hand. Is this the hands of DNA? Oh, mirror, mirror images. Images of them. The structure of DNA was discovered in the 1950s, and it was the combined work of people like Watson and Crick and Franklin and Wilkins, and it was using various techniques like X-ray diffraction. There are a number of forms of DNA, but there are three main forms. So these are the A form, the B form, and the Z form that you find. So the B form is the one that uh, Watson and Crick are describing in their 1953 paper, but Franklin also discovered the A form, and the Z form is the only one of those three that actually has a left-handed double helix structure, so the other two have got a right-handed double helix structure to it. What makes that right-handed type? Right, okay, so it has to, yeah, it has to go. If you looked at it and followed it round, it has to go clockwise, I think. So there's a couple of ways to remind yourself as to how the DNA double helix is supposed to go. The first one is that as I think of it as a staircase. Now, if you were going to climb that staircase, if you need to use your right hand, that means it's a right-handed double helix uh, shape. And the other way is for me, I will turn it clockwise like that, which to the camera is obviously that way around. Point our index finger forward. Turn it clockwise while moving your arm. Oh, oh. In popular culture, you see the DNA double helix all over the place. I mean, news reports, uh, movies, everything. Um, I suppose the big one is Gattaca. Let's do it this way. Because okay. we could. Okay. 
我也是懒惰，对的，哎，你真的在笑。What do you think, Beth? Turn it clockwise. Okay, let's lay. But if you use a stair analogy, you're going down this way, aren't you? You're going that way. So it's anti-clockwise. So it's yeah. not intended. Wrong. Is this all wrong? It's all wrong. Is it? Are these all wrong, or are we just wrong? We're never wrong. Oh, that's true. Why? Why is that even question? <laughs> Yeah, that's completely. That's a left-handed spiral. That's not the right way around. <laughs> I feel like I've just learned how to do like. I know. Right. <laughs> Altered carbon. I've not seen it. It was on Netflix. That had it the wrong way around. I'm gonna be watching that. Yeah, yeah. it's still wrong. <laughs> All right, so I thought that was a good intro on how DNA is right-handed, and I think it's kind of a brain teaser to think about. All right, but I like the analogy that they gave. Point your finger out and turn clockwise. All right, so you might have to think about it a little bit. Uh, but DNA is right-handed in the form that carries genetic material. All right, they mentioned other types of forms, like the A form. All right, so that's when we have DNA and RNA that are combined together. That might be in A form. Uh, the Z DNA, I had to look this up because I had not heard of this, um, but they were thinking that maybe that's involved in some sort of regulation of cell processes, all right? But the, the form that we're going to be talking about that encodes genetic material, that's always going to be right-handed. All right. Now, one other thing I did not talk about that I want to briefly mention is that DNA has grooves. All right, so if we look at a strand of DNA, these, this double helix, we see there's a major groove and a minor groove. It's in this major groove that proteins can bind to affect gene expression, all right? So what gene is actually gonna be encoded and expressed. And then the major groove also provides a binding site for proteins um, that are going to control the gene expression. I think I might've just said the same thing twice here. Um, but basically, major groove, think gene expression that's big enough for proteins to bind. All right, then we also have this minor groove here that's a lot narrower. All right, so because DNA is so important to this unit, I want you to work in groups here, answer these review questions, and make sure we're all on the same page. All right, so go ahead and work together. Oh, yeah. 
I got, suddenly got very quiet. Um, so I'm hoping that means you've had time to think about this. All right, so looking at DNA, what are the monomers? What was that? <laughs> Nucleides, nucleotides, yeah, yeah. We're looking at different nucleotides put together. All right, so nucleotides, that phosphate group, the sugar, and then the nitrogenous base. All right, uh, so if we put those all together, what is the name of the polymer? Anybody has an idea? We could say DNA. Nucleic acids. Yeah, that would be the technical term for a polymer of nucleotides would be nucleic acid. All right? DNA is a type of nucleic acid. All right? Um, let's see. What type of bonding occurs in DNA and where? All right, who wants to list off one type of bonding that occurs? <laughs> All right, covalent. Where does that occur? Where, where, where would we find covalent bonds? Between the monomers. Yes, yes. So what type? What uh, do we call that type of covalent bond? Phosphodiester bonds. Yes, yes. So the covalent bonds that's forming the backbone of DNA, those are those phosphodiester bonds. All right, we're thinking all the way back to unit one here back in September. All right, there's another type of bonding that occurs. Hydrogen, hydrogen bonding. And where does hydrogen bonding occur? Between nitrogenous bases. So that's what's bonding those two strands together and giving us that double helix formation. All right, so if we look at RNA and DNA, what is the biggest difference between the two? All right, one strand versus two strand. RNA is going to be one strand. DNA is going to be two strand. Type of sugar use, all right, a ribose versus a deoxyribose. All right, and what about on those nitrogenous bases? Uracil instead of thymine. All right. Everybody on the same page with DNA? Feel good about it? Close enough. Close enough. All right. Okay, so what are chromosomes? Yeah, so a long... Yes. So it's a long strand of DNA, basically, but chromosome also has proteins that the DNA is going to be wrapped around. All right, so it's a complex of DNA and protein. And we're going to expand on that in a little bit. And then finally, when we talk about the directionality of DNA, how do we typically talk about it? I saw hand gestures. Five to three. Yes, yeah, so five prime to three prime. That's typically how we talk about it. And where do we get those numbers from? The carbon, the car numbers, uh, the numbering system of the carbon on that uh, pentose sugar. Yes. All right. Speaking of directionality, is it the type of DNA we're talking about right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. Yes. All right. Any questions? Sounds good. So we're going to move on and talk about DNA replication. All right, now there was a really interesting experiment, again, in your book that if we have time to talk about uh, further along in this unit, we might come revisit it because I think it's really interesting. Uh, but basically, when we are trying to figure out, you know, how is DNA replicated, there are these three models of thinking, all right? The semi-conservative model, the conservative, and the dispersive, all right? So the semi-conservative after the first round of replication, we had a uh, daughter strand and a parent strand. All right, so the parent strand is the original strand. The daughter strand is the one that has been replicated. 
right? The conservative way of thinking was that we have one uh, double helix of DNA that's from the parent. We have one that's strictly daughter cells or daughter uh, DNA, all right? Versus the dispersive, where there's kind of a mix of both uh, parent and daughter in the uh, first round of replication, all right? So a series of experiments, which I would highly encourage you to look at in your book because it's interesting, uh, let us just uh, say that this semi-conservative mechanism is the mechanism that is um, the one that's used, all right? So we have after our first round of replication, we have one strand that's a daughter strand, one strand that's a, per a parental strand. All right, so how is this made? All right, so in this semi-conservative replication, all right, we have two parental strands that are going to separate and serve as template strands. All right, so we have our double helix up here. It's going to separate at the replication fork, all right? And after the separation, we're going to have two new strands being made, all right? Now, what's kind of guiding this replication is that ATGC rule, all right? We have those complementary base pairs, all right? That's the underlying rule that governs all of DNA replication here, all right? So using that rule, we're going to create two new strands that are identical to the original strand, all right, but there's a lot more involved than just this. All right, there's a lot of proteins, there's a lot of naming, there's a lot of uh, wording that we have to go over. All right, so the origin of replication. This is the actual spot on the chromosome where we can form a replication fork. All right, uh, so if we think about a chromosome up top here, the origin of replication in this particular one is highlighted in blue. And at this spot is where we are going to start to unwind, right, and form that replication fork. Now, bacteria cells, uh, they typically have their chromosome in a circle, all right, and they have one uh, single origin of replication, all right? So basically, there's going to be one spot where it can form that replication fork. Uh, DNA replication is going to occur all the way around, and it's eventually going to meet up in that same spot, right, because it's circular. Now, eukaryotes, all right, thinking about the, the human chromosome, we're way more complex, all right? There's a lot of genetic material that has to be replicated, and in order to be more efficient and not make it a really lengthy process, right, we have multiple origins of replication, all right? So we don't have just one, like bacteria cells. There's going to be multiple, and so we're going to have multiple replication forks, and eventually they're all going to meet up together and be combined into one, all right? All right, so let's look at that replication fork uh, a little bit more in depth. All right, so we have a number of proteins that are going to help with replication. All right, so we have DNA helicase, which is this molecule here. That's going to bind to the DNA. It's always going to travel from, from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. It's going to use ATP to separate the strands and move that replication fork forward. All right, so DNA helicase uh, travels five to three, separating out the strands. We also have another protein, DNA uh, topoisomerase, and I might have butchered that name, but we're going with it. Um, that uh, enzyme is going to be around the DNA, and it's going to help relieve additional coiling, all right, ahead of that replication fork. So I don't know how many of you have ever worked with yarn. I'm a crocheter. Maybe some of you are knitters. If you try to separate out strands of yarn and just pull it, all right, it's going to get highly coiled and probably knot up on you. All right, that's kind of what's happening in DNA here as we're uncoiling DNA. We want to relieve some of that excess coiling. All right, so that's uh, where this enzyme comes into play. Now, we also have a series of these single strand binding proteins, all right, and their purpose is basically not to let the double helix reform. Right? We want it to stay separated so we can have DNA replication occurring. Now we also have one other really important enzyme, all right, DNA polymerase. All right, so DNA polymerase, this is going to be the enzyme that binds onto the strand here and is actually going to covalently link nucleotides together and create this complementary strand. 
All right, so the nucleotides that it's linking together are deoxynucleoside triphosphates. All right, so if we look at nucleotides, what we're generally looking at in DNA is one phosphate group. All right, but before they're combined, uh, they're a triphosphate, so they have three phosphate groups. All right, and it's the addition of these phosphate groups that's going to give it the energy in order to form these bonds and create a new strand of DNA. All right, so uh, these are free nucleotides. They're just kind of hanging around, waiting to be used. They have three phosphate groups. Uh, DNA polymerase is going to come in. All right, it's going to catalyze the reaction where it's going to break the bond uh, between the first and the second phosphate group. All right, now remember, bonds hold energy. So if we're breaking that bond, it's giving uh, this reaction enough energy to bind these two nucleotides together. All right, so that's where the energy is coming from to actually connect the new nucleotide to the strand that's already there. All right, so DNA polymerase plays a huge part in the actual replication, right? But it can't begin, tem uh, begin synthesis on a bare template, right? It needs a, a primer. All right, so we have to have a primer to get started, and generally this primer is going to be made of, uh, of RNA. All right, so we're going to have this primer here. Uh, once the primer is attached, then DNA polymerase can attach and start synthesizing a new strand. All right, now this primer is eventually going to be replaced with DNA at a later point. All right, so we have our primer. We have DNA polymerase. All right, but DNA polymerase can only work in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. All right, so this creates two different strands. All right, so we have our replication fork. One strand is going to be the leading strand. One strand is going to be the lagging strand. All right, now remember DNA, they're anti-parallel to each other. All right, so one side is going to be, uh, let's say, 5 to 3. The other side is going to be 3 to 5. All right, so if DNA polymerase can only work in the 5 to 3 direction, all right, this leading strand is going to be able to be made in one continuous, one long molecule. All right. There's going to be no interruptions there. We're working 5 to 3 as the replication fork unfolds. All right. Now, the lagging strand is opposite. All right. We still have to synthesize our new strand from 5 to 3. All right. But this strand is going from 3 to 5. So what happens is we have all these different fragments that we have to synthesize and eventually join together. All right. So these fragments are Okazaki fragments. All right, I think this is an easy one to remember because the name is so unique, all right, named off of the scientists that discovered this um, process. All right, so these fragments consist of RNA primers plus the DNA, and they get to the point where they butt up with a new RNA primer and they stop. All right, so we're leading, or we're having a bunch of these segments on the lagging strand. So now in both strands here, these RNA primers are eventually going to be removed, replaced uh, by uh, removed by DNA polymerase and then replaced with DNA. All right, so the DNA polymerase comes back in, comes back in, replaces that RNA with DNA. Now we have DNA ligase, all right, yet another enzyme in this process that's going to join these uh, DNA fragments together. All right, so this is happening in the lagging strand where we have all these Okazaki fragments. All right, we have to join those fragments together, and that's what DNA ligase does. All right, it's going to catalyze the covalent bonds to bind those fragments together. So there's a lot of proteins used in DNA synthesis. All right, there's a lot of different ones to remember and what jobs they do. Uh, this is just kind of synthesizing everything all together here. Uh, now, one thing that this image shows is that we have DNA polymerase 3 and DNA polymerase 1. All right, so DNA polymerase 3... Uh, that is what is creating the new strand, all right? We're adding in those nucleotides and linking them together. Now, DNA polymerase 1, that's the polymerase that's going to come back, remove the primer, and add in the DNA, all right? Removing the RNA, adding in the DNA. All right. That's a lot that I gave you all at once, all right? Um, but I want you to remember that this process is very accurate. All right, so we have these three mechanisms that's going to ensure 
that when we're replicating DNA, it is a, as accurate as can be, all right? In fact, we have found that per 100 million nucleotides, there's generally only going to be one mistake, all right? So mistakes do happen, but it's very rare, all right? We have a good success rate. All right, so we have that hydrogen bonding, remember, between the two bases, and that's really stable between um, matched pairs. So between AT and GC, that hydrogen bond is really stable. Now, if those are mismatched pairs, that hydrogen bond is not stable at all. All right, so that leads to um, going back in and finding these mismatched pairs or it just isn't going to combine with that opposite nucleotide at all. All right, so the active site of DNA polymerase is going to be unlikely to form bonds if these pairs are mismatched. And then finally, DNA polymerase can actually proofread. All right, so if it goes long and it finds that it has made a mistake, it will back up, all right, digest the linkage that it made initially, replace it with the correct nucleotide, and then continue forward. All right, now there's many other DNA repair enzymes as well that we're not even going to get into. All right, so I have one other video to help kind of bring this all together. So I know it's a lot of information, and I think this synthesizes it all very well. All right, it's another quick three-minute video here. DNA is a molecule made up of two strands, twisted around each other in a double helix shape. Each strand is made up of a sequence of four chemical bases, represented by the letters A, C, G, and T. The two strands are complementary. This means that wherever there's a T in one strand, there will be an A in the opposite strand. And wherever there's a C, there will be a G in the other strand. Each strand has a five prime end and a three prime end. The two strands run in opposite directions. This determines how each strand of DNA is replicated. The first step in DNA replication is to separate the two strands. This unzipping is done by an enzyme called helicase and results in the formation of a replication fork. The separated strands each provide a template for creating a new strand of DNA. An enzyme called primase starts the process. This enzyme makes a small piece of RNA called a primer. This marks the starting point for the construction of the new strand of DNA. An enzyme called DNA polymerase binds to the primer and will make the new strand of DNA. DNA polymerase can only add DNA bases in one direction, from the five prime end to the three prime end. One of the new strands of DNA, the leading strand, is made continuously the DNA polymerase adding bases one by one in the five prime to three prime direction. The other strand, the lagging strand, cannot be made in this continuous way because it runs in the opposite direction. The DNA polymerase can therefore only make this strand in a series of small chunks called Okazaki fragments. Each fragment is started with an RNA primer. DNA polymerase then adds a short row of DNA bases in the five prime to three prime direction. The next primer is then added further down the lagging strand. Another Okazaki fragment is then made and the process is repeated again. Once the new DNA has been made, the enzyme exonuclease removes all the RNA primers from both strands of DNA. Another DNA polymerase enzyme then fills in the gaps that are left behind with DNA. Finally, the enzyme DNA ligase seals up the fragments of DNA in both strands to form a continuous double strand. DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because each DNA molecule is made up of one old, conserved strand of DNA and one new one. 
All right, any questions on DNA replication? All right. So we have a little bit of time. We might actually finish this lecture. Um, we only have a little bit left, and I want to talk about chromosomes. All right, because on Friday, we're going to start talking about the process of mitosis and meiosis. All right. So the typical eukaryotic chromosome uh, is going to be hundreds of millions of base pairs long. All right. So if we laid that all out, uh, that would be a, like one meter. All right. Now that's that's really really long. All right. So we got to condense it. All right. So we have to fit that one meter of chromosome uh, linkages. Uh, into 10 to 100 microns, all right? So if we look at what that is, right, one millimeter, right, think how small one millimeter is, is still 1,000 microns, all right? So we have to fit into a very, very small space. All right, so when we're talking about chromosomes, there's some terminology that we need to be aware of. So the chromosome, when we're talking about that, it's a discrete unit of genetic material, all right? So we often see it, uh, as these two pairs here, all right, that's the unit of genetic material. Um, but the chromosome is going to be composed of chromatin, all right? So when we talk about chromatin, we're talking about the DNA protein complex. Oh, and I accidentally clicked there. All right, so the chromatin here has DNA and uh, proteins, all right? But as a whole, when we think about it, we're generally going to be talking about it as a chromosome. But if we're talking about it in these different uh, segments and these different parts, then we're talking about the chromatin. All right, so we have to compact this uh, DNA strand um, very tightly. All right, we've got to fit into that very small space. So there's these three levels of compaction that DNA is going to go through. All right, so the first is DNA wrapping. All right, this is where we're going to wrap the DNA around these protein complexes called histones uh, to form a nucleosome. All right, so we have our proteins in here, a bunch of different histone subunits, all right, and we're wrapping the DNA around it, all right, so the combination of DNA and histone, that is a nucleosome, all right, so just this act here is going to shorten the length of DNA uh, by sevenfold. All right, so we're dramatically compacting it with just this one step. All right, but we have to compact it even further. So this is where we get uh, the formation of a 30 nanometer fiber. All right, uh, so in this type of compaction, we're taking all these uh, nucleosomes and we're basically lining them up in this zigzag pattern. All right, that's going to shorten the length another sevenfold. All right. And so what's actually attracting the DNA to these histones is that the histones have positively charged amino acids that are going to attract the negative charges in the phosphate groups of our nucleotides. All right, so we have that attraction going on here, which helps uh, promote that coiling. All right, and then even further, we're going to line them up into this zigzag pattern. So we can think of it as kind of a, a, a bead on a string. All right, we also have one more layer of compaction, all right, and this is the radial loop domains. So in the radial loop domains, we're essentially taking our nucleosomes, all right, that have been formed or been laid out into that zigzag pattern, all right, that 30 nanometer fiber, all right, and it's going to have this interaction with the nuclear matrix. Right, so the nuclear matrix is this filamentous network of proteins inside of the nucleus. Right, we're going to use this filamentous uh, network to kind of anchor the DNA all right, and try to compact it even further. All right, now, not all this DNA is going to be linked. There's going to be some areas that's going to have this loop to it. All right, so these are the radial loop domains. These are typically the areas that are going to have the genes on them. All right, and they're... Uh, further apart, they're more or less exposed. All right, so we have different levels of compaction within this radial loop domain. All right, so we have heterochromatin, which is um, pretty highly com uh, condensed. All right, they're highly condensed regions. And then we have this uh, uro or eurochromatin. 
right? So this euchromatin is going to be less condensed. It's typically going to be in this format when the cell is not dividing, and it's going to have um, more of these radial loop domains. All right, so this is important during cell division. All right, so when cells prepare to divide, those chromosomes have to become even more compacted. All right, so they're going to be uh, in, turned into this heterochromatin versus the euchromatin. All right, so this is where that distinction plays a part. All right, so in metaphase, when we talk about that on Friday, these chromosomes are going to be super compacted. They are going to be considered heterochromatin. All right, so we have all these levels of compaction here. All right, we have these radial loop domains here. This is typically what it's going to look like when it's in a euchromatin format, and that can be uh, condensed even further uh, to form heterochromatin. Does this make, it make sense to everybody? All right, I, I think it's relatively straightforward. It's just a lot of terminology to remember. Um, so there's some additional resources. Uh, this is a good one on chromosome review. Uh, if you like the Amoeba Sisters, they have a good one on DNA replication. All right, plenty of other resources out there. But there is some homework that I'd like you to do for Friday. All right, it's, uh, I think combined it's like 10 minutes of video. All right, I think this one's like three minutes. And this one I'm only going to have you watch a couple minutes of. All right, so you don't have to watch the whole 12-minute video, just the, the time frame between three minutes, 30 seconds, and five minutes, 30 seconds. All right. As a reminder, I do have office hours right after class. So if you did have any questions about the exam, now would be a good time. Yeah.